Good morning, everybody. It's nice to see everybody up here at 9 a.m. in Las Vegas time. Um, I think most of you are on East Coast time, so that's the only reason this works here. Um, welcome. I'm Daryl Henry, the Executive Director of the Western Caucus Foundation, for those of you who don't know me. Um, and it's kind of proud to say this is our ninth year doing this event in Las Vegas. It was probably when the foundation was started, one of our first events that we did. And it was rather small, and uh, I think we started here in the wind. And it's, it's grown tremendously. We have over 200 people you know, with us throughout the weekend of the events that we're doing. So thank you for joining us. This is really great. Um, I do want to recognize on the boards around the room, the sponsors, people that help us make this stuff happen and the stuff we do all year long. Um, if you're not on our social media, please check it out. Because uh, if you're on social media, you'll see uh, that we have a new program uh, that we're working with RFD TV on. They're here filming the news group. Um, and it's a monthly uh, public affairs show based on Western Caucus. So um, take a look at that and uh, see that uh, when you have a chance. And uh, uh, just before we get going, I also wanted to just shout out to staff. Uh, Alyssa back there with the camera is doing our, our communications coordinator. And Pedro, who you've probably all interacted with, um, our outreach coordinator, um, is, you know, just really helps put all this stuff together. and. Uh, makes it work for us and for you, so thank you. But with that, uh, we got a great program this morning. Uh, we're gonna hear from some House Western Caucus chairs about what's going on there. We're gonna have uh, the Commissioner Bureau of Reclamation uh, give us an update on Western Water. Um, we're gonna talk about the rodeo being under attack. We're here at MNFR, I thought it was appropriate to have a little discussion about the rodeo and what's going on around the country. And there's some people here that have been working on that issue and really trying to help save the rodeos. And lastly, uh, we'll have a little chat with uh, Senator Steve Daines about ESA on the 50th anniversary of the Endangered Species Act, which is coming up at the end of December. So that's our program for today, but I'm gonna kick it off and hand it over to our illustrious chairman, the gentleman from the state of Washington, Mr. Dan Newhouse. Good morning. Thank you, Daryl. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for finding the meeting room. Uh, not the easiest task at uh, this early in the morning. You know, I always tell my staff that uh, most of them are here, I believe, that it's uh, if you're going to hoot with the owls at night, it's very hard to soar with the eagles the next morning. So I'm glad to see so many bright and shiny faces here this morning. Well, this is... Um, this is a monumental year for the Western Caucus, just so you know. We've celebrated 25 years. We have 105 members. Uh, it's, it's the most second largest caucus in Washington, D.C., in the House. And I think, uh, since no one's here to uh, refute me, the most in effective caucus. And so I very, very much appreciate your engagement and your involvement. I was told by our host and get this, this is the largest gathering of federally elected officials in Las Vegas ever. Yeah. And so, <clears throat> what I would like to do, most of them uh, are somewhere in town, some of them are here in the room, I want to list for you uh, all of members of Congress and Senate that are, that are here attending the Western Caucus, if I may. Certainly my co-chair, or, or my counterpart in the Senate, the chair of the Senate Western Caucus, uh, Cynthia Lummis from Wyoming, uh, Senator Barrasso from, uh, of Wyoming also, and then as, as you heard, Steve Daines from Montana is also in the room, Senator um, Cindy Hyde-Smith from the great state of Mississippi. Senator, thank you very much for, for coming. And then we have a long list of House members, Mr. Jim Baird, I saw Jim in the room from Indiana, Jim. Mike Bost, Southern Illinois. Mike, Chairman of the Veterans Committee. Uh, Mr. Ron Estes, Ron, I, I know he's here from Kansas and his wife, Susan. Uh, Scott Fitzgerald from Wisconsin. Scott, thank you very much for coming. Ms. Her Harriet Hegeman from the great state of Wyoming is here. Also, Mr. David Joyce from Ohio. We have Mr. Doug LaMalfa from California. Uh, Debbie Lesko, who is on her way. She's driving in from Arizona. Uh, Frank Lucas from Oklahoma is here. Our newest member, made 435, Miss Celeste Malloy from Utah. Um, yeah, thank you. 
Celeste, there, there you are. We also have from Utah, Burgess Owens. Great to have him here. And I'm very proud to say we, this is our, um, I won't say token, but this makes us bipartisan. We are just delighted to have from the great state of Alaska, Mary Peltola. Mary, thank you for being here. Um, August Fluger, Fluger from the great state of Texas. Mr. David Rouser, from, he is the most Eastern member of the Western Caucus from the great state of North Carolina. So David, we're just delighted you're here as well. We also have the chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, Jason Smith from Missouri. Jason, thanks for coming. Um, Ms. Beth Van Dyne, Beth from the great state of Texas is here. And also the chairman of the Natural Resources Committee, Bruce Westerman, whom you all know. So welcome to all those members and I hope that uh, you all, if you wanna, if they're not speaking today, <clears throat> excuse me, I hope you can corner them. If you've got a question for them, they're gonna be with us and a, a great addition to our, our, our meeting. So, so with that, <clears throat> I would like to introduce to you, I, I'm gonna call him our host. Mr. John Porter served in Congress from the great state of Nevada for three terms. Uh, retired in 2009, but that doesn't mean you, you stop serving. John is continues to add value to the conversation on so many different levels and so many different issues. He's a tremendous advocate for the for what are we the Silver State? Is that what Nevada is? Home, I, home means Nevada. Yes. Okay. Um, Become, he has become a great friend and a, a great advocate for many of the issues that Western Caucus stands for. So John, thank you very much for hosting us and I'll turn the microphone over to you. Thank you, John. Uh, good morning, everyone. And as Daryl mentioned, you're here bright and early. I'm impressed. Uh, I too am on Eastern time, so I guess it makes it a little bit easier uh, than when I was on uh, Nevada time. Uh, please know that we're honored to have all of you here. Uh, to our friends in the Senate, thank you. We're honored to have your presence and certainly the members of the House, my former colleagues, uh, and who is doing all the work, the staff that's here. I, I've been there, I understand we can't do without the great staff that you all have, whether it be on the campaign side or certainly on your professional side. Uh, we have a, a very special community and proud that we were able to help host the event uh, this year and, and prior years. And pressure you know, on Noah and Daryl, we're gonna top this next year, right? This one's over, what are we gonna do next year? It's gonna be outstanding. Uh, you did have a chance to see our community. Many of you went to the Hoover Dam yesterday, Lake Mead, you've got to see our community. And we certainly are the entertainment capital of the world, uh, the gaming capital of the world, now the sports capital of the world. <laughs> But I'm, I'm happy you're able to enjoy our community of hospitality. I think one of the friendliest communities anywhere in the world, and we're very proud of that. Uh, we've had a, a tragedy this week, and, and if you keep in mind that we've lost some of our folks here at UNLV, and a couple of uh, highway patrol officers also were, were killed in a tragic accident. So it keeps you know, everything in perspective on who we are as a community. Uh, but I'm really proud that you had a chance to meet everyone. Daryl, uh, outstanding job, thank you. Uh, Noah, where are you hiding? You can't hide, Dar uh, no Noah, where are you? <laughs> 10 foot tall, anyway, uh, Noah, thank you. I also, to the staff of the Western Caucus and Foundation, but also our staff at the Porter Group, uh, some of you have met Rachel, who's a big part of our organization, Stephanie's here as well, and uh, my son Chris, uh, who, we, uh, our offices are at 101 Constitution. And let me also add that if you need a place for a fundraiser, we're at 428 New Jersey across from UPS uh, with a townhouse that's available. And I grew up having to fundraise every day, so I do understand the challenges and know our facilities are truly always available. Uh, also with, with us today um, is a county commissioner from Lincoln County, uh, where, Commissioner Higby from Lincoln County, uh, welcome. We appreciate you being here and a part of the organization. I know uh, an expertise on public lands. And to our friends from the east, uh, east of Washington that may think public lands are a state park, 
Uh, we understand public lands and we appreciate uh, all the challenges and the things that you do to help us uh, as a whole. So I want to say I'm honored to be a part of the team. We help uh, cities, counties, airports, convention authorities, uh, but an area of passion for us is we help individuals with disabilities. I think you've, I've been in front of you talking about employment for individuals with disabilities, so that's another passion for us. But more importantly, uh, we're proud of you. It's a tough job, and I'm always around Capitol Hill heading there shortly. Uh, please let us know if we can help in any way. So again, honored to be here. Appreciate you guys very much. Very historic. Thank you. So we, I'm sorry? Oh, absolutely. Uh, a special guest today, a friend of mine, possibly 30 years, hmm. Lieutenant Governor. Uh, Stavros Anthony, why don't you come up? Our Lieutenant Governor, uh, leadership in the Metropolitan Police Department for years, a city councilman of the city of Las Vegas. And by the way, you're not in the city of Las Vegas here, right? We're in the county of Clark. Uh, but our Lieutenant Governor, Stavros Anthony, good friend and a friend of all of yours. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, good morning, everyone. Again, my name is Stavros Anthony. I'm honored to be uh, Nevada's Lieutenant Governor. Um, welcome to Nevada. Uh, welcome to uh, one of the greatest cities in the world, Las Vegas. Uh, you know, the state of Nevada has uh, probably the same issues that we talk about as most Western states, uh, land, agriculture, water. Uh, but Nevada's always been a little unique because it's constantly reinventing itself. So if you go back to the uh, late 18, uh, 1800s, we had the gold rush up in the Sierra Nevadas, and uh, that was great, changed the world really, and then it started to peter out, and Nevada's trying to figure out what it needs to be, where it wants to go, what's it, it's gonna be its tax base. So when Las Vegas was uh, born in the 30s, uh, we decided to legalize gambling. And that was a big step to do that. Uh, it was slow going, we still needed a tax base, so we started doing other things like uh, legalizing uh, quickie divorces. <laughs> and uh, that was going pretty well, so we decided to legalize uh, quickie uh, weddings so we could handle both sides and collect money. Um, and I could go on and on about the different things that Nevada uh, gets into. Uh, but. Uh, Importantly, when I moved here in 1980 to join the uh, Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department, as John mentioned, I mean, I thought I was in heaven. We had $1.99 buffet breakfast. We had uh, $5.99 steak dinners with lobster. Uh, we had some pretty nice casinos here, uh, but they were kind of still run by the mob, and they're starting to kind of peter out because the FBI started to do a pretty good job of getting rid of them. And again, Las Vegas, uh, we're trying to figure out where we're going to go next. And uh, Steve Wynn, actually in his uh, house here, uh, decided to build a mega resort, the Mirage. And that took us to the next level. So what we decided to do at that point was start blowing stuff up. So we blew up the Hacienda, we blew up the Stardust, we blew up the Desert Inn, we blew up the Aladdin. Uh, I could go on and on about uh, different, and then we replaced them with these massive mega resorts. And we started moving from just not a gaming town to uh, the capital of the world for everything. So you look at Las Vegas today, and we're the capital world of the world for gaming and gaming resorts. We're also the capital of the world for restaurants. We're the capital of the world for entertainment. Uh, we're the capital of the world for shopping. So even though we're a gaming town, Las Vegas is really transi transitioned into, you can come here and you don't have to gamble. Uh, but we want you to gamble. We want you to spend your money. Uh, we want you to have a great time. If you have any change left in your pocket, we have slot machines at the airport before you get on the plane. You can just leave your money there. Uh, but that, that's why Nevada and Las Vegas is such a great place, because we're constantly changing who we are. And we just opened up the, uh, the Fountain Blue right across the street, well, I think in a week. The resort, but the interesting, the last final comment I'll make is um, I used to be on the Las Vegas City Council. I was there for uh, 13 years, and 10 years ago, uh, we were talking about let's try to get um, Major League Sports to Las Vegas. So we started talking to the professional uh, leagues, and they said, uh, not only no, but hell no. We're not coming to a gaming town. 
It's going to be corruption. There'll be mixture of gaming and sports, and people are going to get in trouble, and we're never going to come to Las Vegas. So a uh, gentleman by the name of uh, Mr. Foley uh, decided to take a leap of faith, and he said, what about hockey in the desert, where it's 120 degrees in the summer? And he built, on his own dime, the, uh, the Las Vegas uh, Golden Knights, and uh, they're now, six years later, the, the uh, owners of the Stanley Cup. And today, Major League Sports is tripping over themselves to come to Las Vegas. We have the Raiders, we have the Aces who are the champions, we have Major League Lacrosse, we have professional women's volleyball, we have the Aces coming, uh, where the Aces are here, we have the, uh, the Oakland A's that are coming, we just had the F1. So it's, it's amazing how one minute we're one thing and the next minute we're something else. And that's why I just love this state and I, I love this city. So. Uh, have a great time while you're here. Uh, the NFR, I um, understand you're going tonight. One of the best uh, sporting events you'll ever go to. And uh, again, welcome to our great state. Welcome to our city. Please leave all your money behind. Thank you. <laughs> and, and now for the next act. Some of you, many of you have been to the premier event on Capitol Hill. That's Vegas night. Uh, we have close to 500 staff and members that come to the event every year that's uh, sponsored by the uh, Vegas Chamber of Commerce. Uh, you will also see a lot of our community leaders, uh, Mayor John, former Mayor John Lee is here from North Las Vegas, uh, but you had a chance to meet other mayors yesterday. But this is a formal invite. It's always the second week of September. It's turned into the premier event in Washington, D.C., so you'll get to see more of Vegas. We have. We have tables, you play poker within the rules, uh, but no, you're always welcome here in Las Vegas. And part of that hospitality is please join us in September for our, our number one event on Capitol Hill. So with that, thank you, Chairman. It's an honor to be here. Appreciate it. Good job. Well, that's perfect. Mr. Lieutenant Governor, it's refreshing to have the honesty about what it is that you're all about here. <laughs> We all, we all suspected, but now we know for sure. So now to get into the, to, to the heart of our meeting to talk about some of the issues. And I'm just going to lead that off real quickly um, with some of the things that the Western Caucus has been engaged in over the last 12 months. And then I'm going to ask uh, some of the chairman and committee chairs, uh, subcommittee chairs, to come up and give you a, a little bit of a thumbnail sketch of, about what they've been engaged in as, as well. So, let me tell you, it has truly been a busy, exciting year for us at the Western Caucus. Um, like I mentioned, we are at over 100 members, 105 strong. I think I, none, none of us were in the Western Caucus 25 years ago, but I think we could have, as a group, met in a phone booth, literally. There, there was a very small group of Western members, so it's exciting to see it grow. And that, you know what that means <clears throat> is that we have over a hundred advocates in Congress for Western and rural issues in the United States. And I think that that's, that's tremendous when we truly on a daily basis have to fight for our way of life, which is unfortunate. But I'm just heartened that we have such a strong group doing that. So just some examples of what we've done. Uh, we traveled to a lot of different member districts, and I'll just tell you a couple of them. We've gone from Fort Worth, Texas, to Wisconsin, from Minnesota to Yosemite. Uh, we, we, we try to put literally, and a great example here I can say this, because most of you are wearing, we try to put boots on the ground. Is that, that's what we want to do. We want to meet with the, the local people in the areas that are having to deal with the the issues and the challenges, um, and understand, we want to talk to them you know, face to face, look them in the eye, understand how they uh, are impacted by policies that, that we pass in Congress in Washington, D.C., uh, miles and miles away. We held forums in Washington focusing on hydropower, on permitting, uh, on the Endangered Species Act, in something interesting that uh, Congress is putting a lot of attention towards. 
on the Chinese Communist Party and many of the challenges that they present to us as a nation, one in particular being the purchase of agricultural assets and farmland in the United States. Um, this spring, uh, the Western Caucus endorsed and helped to get across the finish line H.R. 1, and that's the Lower Energy Cost Act. Uh, the, the, the purpose of that is to prioritize and truly unleash American energy, particularly from uh, the resources from our federal lands. We've been uh, leading the fight against the BLM, the Bureau of Land Management, and their proposed landscape and conservation health rule. Some of you know a lot about that. This is a rule as part of this administration's what uh, we would call a land grab across the West, and it undermines the multiple use mandate for our lands under the Federal Lands Policy and Management Act. <clears throat> our humble opinion is this, that the BLM is confusing conservation and preservation and ignoring the congressional intent on this issue. They don't have the authority for this rule and we'll continue to hold them accountable. This summer, along with Chairman Westerman, Bruce is in the room, he's chairman of the Natural Res Resources Committee and you're gonna hear from him in just a minute. We established an Endangered Species um, Act working group with the intention of looking at ways that we can make that law work better, not only for people, but for the species that it was intended to protect. And since we've launched that group, we've held lots of productive meetings, um, not only among members, but also among our staff members, and also, most importantly, with stakeholders who understand the importance of reforming and modernizing the ESA. Um, so, we've heard from, from people, uh, from communities representing farmers, from ranchers, offshore energy, uh, sportsmen, small, small businesses, all who shared their thoughts on how the ESA can better help recover species while also reducing regulatory burdens that are placed on, on, on our, all of our partners uh, literally on the ground. I think uh, reforming the ESA is gonna be one of our top issues of the Western Caucus. It's certainly central to our mission of protecting private property rights. Uh, throughout this year, we've led the charge against the administration's overreaching WOTUS rule, and that is, as you know, key to protecting landowners' rights. And we'll continue to hold them accountable um, to follow the parameters of the WOTUS set by the Supreme Court in the Sackett versus the EPA ruling. Um, by all measurements, 2023 has been a very successful year for the Western Caucus. Uh, and next year, we'll continue our efforts to get out into the country, to tour across the West, across rural America, um, including, and just keep, keep these in, in, your, in your radar in case you want to participate. We're planning to go to the southern border. Uh, we're also planning to go up to Lake Tahoe and also to the great state of Wyoming, among other places that we'll be focusing on. So, as, as chairman, I look forward to continuing to work as hard as we can to amplify, to elevate the voices of people in rural and western communities. It's, uh, we call ourselves the voice of rural America on Capitol Hill, and I want to make sure that we live up, live up to that title. So now, as I promised you, uh, I want to ask some of our chairmen that are in attendance to come up and talk a little bit about some of the things that they've been engaged, engaged in. And uh, chairman, I'm gonna admonish you, pretend that you're uh, on a panel and a committee and you've got five minutes, all right? And then we're gonna get out the big hook and bring up the next, all right? We can do that. So first of all, uh, chairman of the House Natural Resources Committee, you all know our good friend of the Western Caucus, Mr. Bruce Westerman from Arkansas. Bruce, happy to have you here. Come on. Well, good morning and thank you all for being here. Dan, thank you for the great job that uh, you're doing with the Western Caucus. And uh, we've been able to team together on a lot of activities. And I can tell you, uh, 
going into my 10th year of Congress and serving as the chairman of the Natural Resources Committee, one of the best decisions I made was to get involved in Western Caucus early on, and it's helped, um, helped me learn a lot of things and also helped shape a lot of the, uh, the activities I do as chairman of the committee. We've uh, tried to take the message out to the people and hear from the people all across the country through field hearings, and that's something that I picked up on the importance of by participating in Western Caucus events. And they say the best form of flattery is to be copied. And uh, Jason Smith's here. And they've even started doing field hearings in Ways and Means. Um, and Jason and I have a little, little running joke about that. But uh, field hearings are fantastic because you get out and you see what's happening on the ground. On the committee, we're focused really on the, in the big picture on access. And never before have our natural resources, I think, been as critical and important to our country as they are today. And that's saying a lot. If you go in the House chamber, uh, there's a plaque up above where the speaker sits. And the quote by Daniel Webster, and the end of that quote talks about seeing if we can do something important in our world today. And the first line of that says, let us develop our natural resources. Uh, resources have always been critically important to our country, uh, but when you look at the necessities of life, those all come from the land, food, clothing, and shelter, the energy that we use, the energy not only to uh, move us around, but the energy to heat and cool our homes, to power our factories, and the energy uh, that makes the, the nitrogen fertilizer that goes into farming that makes our farmlands productive, that allows us to feed ourselves and help feed uh, parts of the world. And I don't think ever before in our country's history have we seen an attack on the development of our resources like we see today. And it feels like we're playing defense a lot of times, but we have to play offense on this. And we're doing that with legislation. It's already been mentioned, the HR1, uh, our resources are important enough and energy is important, en important enough to our country that House Republicans said that the number one most important bill for this Congress is the Lower Energy Cost Act. And it's about energy and much more. It's about developing energy on federal lands and federal waters, but it's also about mining on federal lands and federal waters. It's about um, permitting reform. And this is, I think, really laid the groundwork for a comprehensive bill on what will help rural America, which will help America as a whole, and will also help us going forward in giving the message to the American people about why our resources are important. And I proudly stand and say that um, conservatives are conservationists. We've always been conservationists. The, the word conservation is derived from conservative. And in everything we do, when we look at accessing these resources, when we look at accessing federal lands, we want to keep in mind that we want to leave everything here better for future generations. And that includes our economy. That includes our ability to feed and clothe and take care of our citizens here in America. Uh, but we're facing threats globally, and everything that we do in natural resources ties in to everything that's happening globally with energy, that's happening with our national security. And we play a very critical, important role in making America strong, in making America's economy the economy that's still going to be the dominant economy in the world going forward. But if we continue to attack the things that have made our economy strong, the things that have made us uh, or given us the ability to be self-sufficient, the ability to focus resources on other things like health care and research and innovation, it's going to harm us on the world stage. And it's going to harm the world in the long run. So that's why we take everything very seriously that we do in natural resources and why we look at the big picture and why we want Americans to be able to have a thriving, growing economy, why we want Americans to be able to recreate and use the lands that are federal lands that belong to all of us. And it's why we're going to continue taking that fight in the House of Representatives every chance that we get. And you know, our committee deals with not only 
the natural resources that we have, but we, we also deal with a lot of tribal issues. And I found that we've got a tremendous human resource in our tribal partners across the country. An untapped resource, when it comes to forestry management, and we had a hearing on this just a week or so ago, our tribes are doing a lot better job than our federal land managers are. And that's why we're looking for policies like good neighbor authority to let tribes not only um, have more freedom to manage on their own lands, but to uh, be able to come over and manage on uh, other federal lands. Uh, we want to, I think we need to empower uh, tribes on fisheries management and wildlife management. And there's so many good things we can do if we will focus on a goal to make America better, on a goal to utilize and conserve and have access to our resources. And uh, without getting into all the specifics and probably the 30 seconds I've already gone over, I just want to say thank you to your support for being here. And we have an open door. We want to hear what's happening uh, in your part of the world, and we want to know how we can help to make it better. And I'm not going to say any more about ESA, but we could talk a long time about that. Thank you, and I will yield the chair. Thank you, Bruce. That was great. Um, you mentioned conservation and conservative. I think farmers, being a farmer myself, we're the original conservationists because we depend on the land and on the water for our own livelihoods and we want to pass that on to future generations so we try as hard as we can to protect it. Next I want to turn to someone who's been a very active strong member of the Western Caucus, he leads our Ways and Means committee, committee in the House from Missouri, Jason Smith. Jason could you come up and talk about some of the many, many things that you guys are talking about in your committee and having an impact on. Jason Smith, thank you. First off, I just want to say thank you to Dan for his champion and leadership for the Western Caucus. Um, that's why we have such a large membership and we appreciate all that you do. Um, it's great to follow Chairman Westerman. Um, uh, you know, being the chairman of the Natural Resources Committee, you would think that you would have the first outdoor field hearing as a chairman. <laughs> but apparently the Ways and Means Committee had to teach Mr. Westerman of how to do an outdoor field hearing. And we did the first outdoor field hearing of any committee since the Civil Rights Movement. Um, and that was in Staten Island, New York at the port. And then Bruce kind of followed a little bit after that. But... <laughs> It's all right. Um, I, will, I will say that on the Ways and Means Committee, we've been pretty busy. Um, we're focused in six different areas, uh, tax, trade, healthcare, social security, work and welfare, and also oversight. Whenever I took over the chairmanship of the Ways and Means Committee, in my first couple weeks, I set up a whistleblower hotline so that any employee of the IRS could contact us of anything that we needed to be aware of. Believe me, we've got a lot of contacts from the IRS. And that ultimately led to the two IRS whistleblowers that's been in the news, Mr. Ziegler and Gary Shapley. And so we have been extremely busy from an oversight perspective just in itself on the Ways and Means Committee, but also from tax, trade, health care. I'm extremely proud of how hard the committee members of my team have been working. In fact, the very first committee hearing we had this year was not in Washington, D.C. It was actually in Petersburg, West Virginia, in a lumber yard. And it was the state of America's economy, Appalachia, so that we could hear from small business owners, farmers, coal miners, working moms of the issues that they're facing. We then went to Yukon, Oklahoma to a barn. We then went to Peachtree City, Georgia to a factory. State of America's economy in the heartland, State of America's economy in the south. And from those three field hearings is what crafted the American Families and Jobs Act, which our committee passed out in June, which was, which was multiple tax items that addressed what was brought up from real Americans outside of Washington. And that is what we're working on right now. 
Um, we are in a great negotiations with the Senate to hopefully get an end of year tax package. And when I say end of year, I'm talking about over the next two months, um, the year, let's say legislative year. That's probably a little bit better. But um, it's actually, uh, it's going fairly, fairly well. And I think that we can deliver. And that's what working families and small businesses and farmers are counting on when it comes to trade. We passed the, the beginning stage of the U.S.-Taiwan trade agreement. Every Republican, every Democrat in the House and in the Senate voted for it. That's a good step. It's the most bipartisan pre-agreement ever in the history of Congress. And then in regards to health care, we've been working on the price transparency bill that will be on the floor on Monday with the Energy and Commerce Committee and also Education and Labor. So we're walking and chewing gum, staying a little bit busy, having more filled hearings than the Natural Resources Committee. But um, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an honor to be able to lead such an incredible <laughs> group of members that serve on the House Ways and Means Committee. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Jason. You know, uh, you may have been the first, but it's going to be, it's kind of hard to beat the joint uh, field hearing that the Western Caucus had with House Natural Resources using Yosemite National Park as our backdrop. Just, just, just say. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> any day of the week. <clears throat> Next, I want to turn to another full committee chair, Mr. Mike Bost from the great state of Illinois. He's chairman of our Veterans Affairs Committee. And let me tell you, Mike, not only is he a, just a great friend, uh, but he is a tremendous leader, a perfect fit for this committee. He's, an, he's a Marine first and foremost. He has, he's been out to my district talking to uh, my my uh, veterans groups and just has a, a tremendous rapport for those people that have worn the uniform and his heart is truly in this. So Mike, thank you for being here. Could you talk with us a little bit about what you're up to? Thank you, Dan. And we want to say thank you to Dan. He does a great job with the Western Caucus and thank you for participating here in, with the Western Caucus. <clears throat> Let me tell you that I don't have to try to compete on field hearings because when you're in head of the VA, you have to do them in the field because the, you can't get the hospitals to come to see you, so you go see them. Um, as Stan said, um, I am a United States Marine. My dad and my uncles were Army. My grandfather on my mother's side, a grandfather I didn't know he passed away, right after my mom and dad married. He was Navy, Second World War, but then my grandmother married the guy that became like my grandfather, following after him. I went in the Marine Corps. His son went in the Marine Corps, was a victim of the ultimate oxymoron in the Vietnam War, that's friendly fire, um, and, uh, but he's very healthy today because of the VA. I have a son today who is a lieutenant colonel and also a setting judge in deep southern Illinois. And I have a grandson who is an F-18 mechanic in Miramar, California. He's a corporal picking up a sergeant. So as you can see, it's kind of personal to me when we deal with the issues that our veterans face. And let me say this, that I want to say a special thank you to all my colleagues that are here, because especially those who serve on the, uh, the uh, forming committee, or in the, uh, that, that actually they vote on who becomes chair. I'm a truck driver's son from deep southern Illinois, and I never knew that I'd have the honor to serve as a chairman of the VA committee. But let me tell you, it comes with a lot of responsibility, and should. The VA is the second largest bureaucracy in the world. So if you think there isn't a problem, wait five minutes. Guaranteed, there's going to be. And there, it, but, it, but it is so great and rewarding with the things you can do. So many people think that the VA is only the medical side. Well, that's the big part. But understand also, we have the GI Bill, we have veteran home loans, we have the disability side to, to rate a person's disability so they can receive the benefits, and then we have every cemetery, veteran cemetery in the United States, and every veteran cemetery and war, war memorial around the world. And we're doing some amazing things. Now, let me tell you just kind of a rough sketch of what we have been working on that is vitally important. And then I want to go into just a little bit, and it won't take me that long, of some really cool things that are happening in the VA. First off, let me tell you things we're working on. Right now, we're trying to get the electronic health records system straightened out. 
was supposed to have been rolled out to every VA by now. So far it's been rolled out to five over the last eight years and we spent way too much money and it still doesn't work. You would think that it would be something simple, but uh, we're, we've got to keep a monitoring of that at all times to try to get this system to work. It should be able to the day you swear in as a military personnel until the day you die or your, the day that your family receives last benefits, it should be a smooth transition. Unfortunately, it's not. We're trying to get that that way. Uh, we had passed two year, a year and a half ago the PACT Act. Uh, the PACT Act is a large expansion of the existing health care system. Here's why. The PACT Act is so that those toxic exposed veterans from post 9-11 do not go through what happened with the Agent Orange and Blue Water Navy veterans, which basically before we realized that there was a problem with them, two thirds of them had died off. So we expanded the PACT Act. Now we're implementing the PACT Act. Uh, our TAP program. Our TAP program is a transition, okay? So many of our veterans don't, they, they're so happy to get out of the military, or, or their life is changing so rapidly that they don't get to know and understand everything that is offered to them as a veteran. So what we're doing with DOD, and if you have some of the places it does well, sometimes it doesn't, it's a transition assistance program. There, whenever I got out in 1982, there was a TAP program. A, a, a full bird colonel walked up, tapped me on the shoulder and said, nice, thanks for your service. That was a TAP program. <laughs> now we, have, we go through a lot to, to make sure that we give the support they need. Then we are also working on our homeless veterans. So many people see, and it depends on where you're at, the amount of homeless veterans that we have out there. But what we can't just say, here's a housing for you, because we need to find out why that veteran is homeless. And then we find out whether it's mental health, whether it's drugs, whether it's mental health caused drugs or drugs caused mental health, and then really figure out their problems and try to get them back into a productive part of society. Um, we're in promoting employment for veterans. And so we're working hard to make sure that those people who have served us are served at the level they are and know that they get to get and receive their benefits that are there. But now let me tell you some really cool stuff. Well, first let me tell you something really funny. When I said that, it's not funny, it's sad, but it's like this is what, when I said that if you don't think there's a problem, wait five minutes. When I was ranking member, had not taken over as chairman yet, we weren't in the majority yet, my staff director came in and she said, boss, we got a problem. That's not a good way to start the day. But I said, okay, what's going on? And she said, uh, well, Arlington, um, do you know they have a green field? And I said, what's a green field? Well, a senator several years ago, uh, because his constituents came to him and asked him, because they, they didn't want the tombstones all over the place. So they want an area that you don't have tombstones, you just have sod. And I went, and they inter them? And how do you mark? They go, no, no, it, it is only for those who are being cremated. And then they roll back the sod, and they sprinkle the ashes, and they roll the sod back over. I said, I didn't know we had that. They said, neither did the contractor who dug it up and hauled it to the landfill. You see, that's a problem. Um, we were able to work with the families <laughs> and smooth this over. I, and you learn a whole lot about the cremation and, and that they may not spread all the ashes. And so, but they handled, handled very well. And not only that, a lot of people did not use this, uh, uh, that particular system. So we're good there. But let me tell you the positive things that are going on right now. You know, we, VA does a lot of investment into research and development of things that will, DOD, Department of Defense, their job is to put a bullet down range. And naturally what happens when you put a bullet down range is people are injured. Sometimes physically, sometimes mentally. VA's job is to make them as whole as you possibly can be. Right now with the research that they're doing, um, so years ago they used to, uh, when you had a prosthesis, uh, it took a long time to fit the cup. Now, there's a system that's on an iPad, and the doctor walks in, does this, they put it in a uh, 3D printer, and it is a perfect fit. Um, that technology was developed in the VA. Um, another one is, we're working on exoskeletons. Matter of fact, about three years ago, the first young lady 
that was in this experimental process, quadriplegic, walk to 5K. She has come out to DC and visited us, and, and um, she's doing great, but others are in the process right now of learning how those systems can work and how to improve on those systems so what I said can be done, making whole that which is broken. Um, and then the other thing that is fantastic, and this is going on and we're waiting for the approval uh, through all the medical approval, in um, Seattle, Washington at the VA, they have discovered how to make growing bone. Let me tell you, explain that to you. Let's say that someone takes a round or has an accident and they crush a femur, okay? Well, quite often the op only option would be amputate and or do something else because you're not gonna heal when the bone's crushed. Now, uh, with this process, they will be able to x-ray, calculate, and draw out a 3D printing process of what bone they need to go in. They take calcium, uh, other chemicals that naturally make up the bone. They take the, the uh, victim or the, the patient uh, fatty tissue out of their body. They mix it and blend it. They take and 3D print it. They do the surgery, they put it in place, and it grows like a broken bone back together. Hmm. That's amazing. And that's the research that we're doing in the VA that so many people don't realize. That investment not only benefits the VA, but is benefited in the private sector too. Now, I said I'm, I, what an honor it is to serve those who have served us. And I, I'm telling you, it's an exciting place to be. Um, it's really strange, though, of the four corners, this is so wild. Um, in the, on the BA system, I'm the only veteran. That's really, really strange. But at any rate, um, I want to thank you for being here. And let me tell you, we're going to keep working hard for the veterans. Um, like I said, I'm blessed beyond measure to be able to provide for them. And enjoy your weekend. Perfect.